I think. All right, we're good. Good. All right, welcome everyone. This is the very first episode of Finding the Source. I am joined today with my colleague, Dr. Ashley Lusky. Uh, she and I will be co-hosting the show. She'll be going solo from time to time. And our first guest today is Eric Mink. Eric Mink, who is at Fredericksburg in Spotsylvania National Military Park. He has uh, had a long career in the Park Service, and he's been in many other sites, including Richmond National Battlefield Park, as well as Gettysburg. You were at Gettysburg more as a, I believe, a seasonal. Uh, Eric, in fact, is a native of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, grew up right on the battlefield, essentially, uh, and he has a connection to Gettysburg College. He's going to be impressed that I remember this fun fact about Eric's life. He spent, uh, I don't think it was a summers, but it was a job, a part-time job at Servo here at Gettysburg College. Is that correct, Eric? It is, right? Uh, that is correct. And uh, as, I, as I like to remind whenever I talk to your students out there at the college is when you throw your tray through that little slot when you're yeah. done eating, just remember there are people there are, behind there are people that are that. Well, Eric, the students are universally nice to the folks at Servo because, as you know, the cookies there are incredible. Students aren't so nice to professors because all we can give them are grades. And uh, so, yeah. So you spent some time here at Gettysburg, but you, for whatever reason, we won't go into the details, did not come to Gettysburg College, but instead you did his undergraduate at Mary Washington College, uh, where you majored in historic preservation. Did you major in history as well or just historic preservation? Um, I double majored historic preservation and American studies. Oh, I didn't realize that. American studies. Okay. Excellent. So we're really pleased to have Eric uh, here with us today. And the finding the source, the idea, uh, the hook, so to speak, is that we're going to um, begin every show with an artifact, a document, uh, a monument, a piece of visual culture. And from there, of course, the conversation would just take off. Ashley, it is correct, is it not, that one can type in questions and we will from time to time interrupt uh, Eric uh, with a question or two uh, as well. So uh, yes, if you have questions or comments, we, we have a running toolbar so we can see that and we encourage you to get involved uh, in the discussion if you'd like. And I should have also uh, mentioned that uh, Eric has been on the faculty of the Civil War Institute for a number uh, uh, of our conferences. He's done battlefield tours, and he's also given formal presentations. And I, again, the final plug here is that he has been extremely um, good to our students here at the college. He has spoken to my public history classes. He's worked with our students over the course of the summer. So we're very excited and, uh, and very grateful that he's decided to join us today. I will then turn it over to Ashley and let her get us started with the first question for Eric. So before we get started uh, in, into kind of the meat of the, the matter here, Eric, um, I think a lot of people out there have some questions about what exactly a cultural resources specialist does, what are cultural resources per se, um, what kind of hats do you wear as the cultural resources specialist at Fredericksburg? Um, but in particular, what was the, the source for your inspiration in particular to join uh, the National Park Service and specifically um, to get involved in cultural resource management where you are dealing with, of course, a, a plethora of other sources, monuments and battlefield landscapes and the like, but what was the personal source of inspiration for you? Yeah, all right. Well, um, uh, I have to admit that until I started working for the National Park Service, I wasn't all that familiar with cultural resource management, um, even what it is. So the position that I hold today as cultural resource specialist at Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park um, is uh, one that I kind of stumbled into. Um, and uh, after um, beginning my work with the Park Service, uh, and just to go back, um, I appreciate, Pete, that you uh, uh, referred to me as a native of Gettysburg. But uh, to be perfectly honest, I, I, I moved there when when I was six, our family moved there when I was six. So I, uh, yeah, my interest in history, uh, my father, I'm an army brat. Uh, every three years we were on the move up and down the East Coast and lived in New York, lived in um, Maine. Uh, and 
honestly, our family vacations during the summers were to historic sites. So I have very, very fond memories of uh, forts, uh, uh, William Henry, Ticonderoga. We used to go cross country skiing in the winters on Saratoga battlefield, um, all those places. And so when we moved to Gettysburg and I was 11 years old, I mean, obviously, you know, the two of you living in Gettysburg, you can't avoid the civil war if you want to. Uh, I mean, uh, it is what it is in that town. And, uh, my father and I got interested in and we started uh, Civil War reenacting when I was 11, um, he and I, and, and I actually continued that until uh, five years ago. Uh, so three quarters of my life, my weekends were spent uh, uh, you know, uh, putting on a uniform and participating in living histories and, and battle reenactments. And that really, as a kid, honestly, gave me a, a fun, a very uh, important appreciation for material culture. Uh, uniforms, equipment, uh, tangible things, and listening to people who studied those. And so uh, very much uh, that had a, uh, an impact on me. Uh, also, growing up in Gettysburg, I used to sit on the floor of my fa parents' uh, family room and flip through the pages of uh, William Frazanito's uh, Gettysburg uh, book. And uh, so I attended the Civil War Institute as a scholar and uh, as a uh, scholarship recipient in high school in 1987. I was getting ready to go into my senior year. Uh, Terry Fox was my high school uh, teacher, and he was a licensed battlefield guide. And Terry understood. He was also the coach of our high school baseball team. But Terry understood my, my interest in Civil War and recommended the Civil War Institute. And it was at the Institute I went on my very first battlefield tour, um, 17 years old, uh, and standing with Ed Bars at uh, the uh, uh, bridge over uh, Bull Run at Manassas. And then also going out on the battlefield with William Frazanito. And so uh, those things had a huge impact on me. It was about, you know, the sense of place being on the landscape and discussing history. So I pursued uh, Mary Washington as, as my college. Uh, at the time in the late 80s, I think there were two or three maybe uh, universities in the country that had undergrad programs in historic preservation. And so Mary Washington was one of those. And uh, so uh, I was able to get in and took me five years, but uh, I double majored. Um, and the program was not designed really to send you out into the world as an archeologist or as an architectural historian. Those are the things we studied uh, in historic preservation. Uh, it was really designed for you to go on to grad school and then focus in one of those disciplines. Uh, five years of school, I was not a very good student and grad school was not in my fee uh, future. Uh, and after five years, two degrees, I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do. Um, and uh, so I applied for a summer job with the Park Service here in Fredericksburg. And uh, God bless him, Greg Mertz, the supervisor at the time, uh, took pity and hired me. I was the last hire that summer. Um, and uh, within six months of working for, uh, as a summer employee and a seasonal employee, I decided this is what I wanted to do. Um, but I also understood I wanted something more than going out and giving tours. Uh, it was great, it's rewarding, I still enjoy doing it, but uh, uh, I came to realize that there was an avenue in the NPS to apply that history to the landscape uh, in other ways, and that was cultural resource management. And uh, fortunately, during my uh, summers uh, working for the park, because uh, I managed to continue to string along uh, summer employment, uh, I got to work with the cultural resource specialist here at Fredericksburg, who was Noel Harrison, uh, one of my mentors and still one of my very good friends. And Noel really taught me the importance of, you know, understanding the resources, understanding those tangible things that are left behind uh, from these historic events. And uh, Noel used to send me out to run over property looking and I'd stumble upon earthworks, breastworks, defenses, uh, that people hadn't seen in, you know, decades uh, on private property. People would call us and ask us to come and look at their property. And so that, uh, I really focused on that. And so after a number of years, I was able to come back here to Fredericksburg um, as the cultural resource specialist. And um, so I've been doing it now here at Fredericksburg, uh, filling that position for the past, uh, let's see, 20 years, 19 years. Um, as the cultural resource specialist. I still very much enjoy uh, constantly learning, learning and, and seeing uh, new things. 
but it's interesting when Pete's student, when Pete has asked and other universities have asked, or I go to talk to folks and they say, well, what do you do? I always have to dig deep to try to really explain what cultural resource management is. Um, and uh, uh, it's really, uh, it's interesting. Uh, it really is. And it's very rewarding. Um, there are 421 units in the National Park Service. And almost every park in the system has what we call cultural resources, you know, and uh, cultural resources are the physical material evidence of past human activities. Um, we see them as sites, objects, landscapes, structures. They are the tangible um, reminders of history, um, of man and these events. And we, the Park Service, view these resources, these historic buildings or these landscapes or these artifacts, uh, we view them as finite and non-renewable. You know, they are authentic. If you have a building that was here during the Civil War and that building disappears, decays, burns to the ground, you can't rebuild that building. You can build a building, but it's not that building that was here at the time. And so we take that authenticity and that significance in the fact that it's finite and renewable um, and so we seek to preserve and conserve those resources. Um, the nation's historic and cultural resources, you know, they are the physical reminders, you know, of those times. And as a land management agency, you know, we view ourselves as being in the forever business. You know, the national parks aren't here for 10 years. They're not here, here for 100 years. We have to view them as being here essentially forever and managing, uh, managing them in that way. Um, and so my job and the cultural resource specialists and managers at all national parks, you know, that is what we are here to do is to manage those resources. Um, so uh, that was a bit lengthy about uh, me and, and about what it is. But uh, no, that, Eric, that's excellent. When you speak of the managing of the resource, can you help us understand how your management of that resource, how does it shape and inform what, the audience would know as historians, we call them interpreters. How, tell us that relationship and how that goes back and forth and how your work enriches their thinking and their programs for the public and vice versa. Right. Okay. Well, first off, uh, you know, what a cultural resource manager or specialist at a park does um, is those historic cultural resources. We, you know, there are five types, archaeological resources, historic structures, landscapes, museum objects, ethnographic resources. We are um, bound by law to pay attention to those historic resources and to do what we can to minimize impact to them on these federal properties, on these national parks. And so cultural resource management has essentially like three legs to the stool that we sit on. Um, in order to be able to take care of these things, we have to understand them. So cultural resource management says that we are to research and document and inventory those historic resources. So in other words, we have to know what they are and we have to know as much as we can possibly know about them. And then that research goes into things such as planning. Um, we take that research and we give that to the rest of the park management team so that we can plan and take into consideration what our planning, what our projects may or may not do to those resources. And then finally, there's uh, stewardship. We wanna protect them. We wanna hand them off to the next generation. So the way that fits into interpretation, the folks on the battlefield uh, giving tours, um, the National Park Service says that interpretation uh, really is driven by the resource. We are interpreting the resource. You know, if it weren't for the land, the Park Service wouldn't be here. If it weren't for these resources, the Park Service wouldn't be here. And so we're interpreting those resources. So for Park Service management and for the interpreters, we provide the research, the documentation of these places. If you're giving a tour of a house, people are going to want to know about the house. And so we do uh, promote the research of those resources. And that then plays into interpreters on the uh, field out in the park, uh, using that information to develop their programs. Ash, I'm on a quick follow-up before I, I turn it over to you. I, there has to though, be at times 
not competing agendas between interpretation and cultural resources, but let me give you an, an example. And just again, it's not related to your park, so I'm not asking you to make an official statement on anything. But I remember a park where I did seasonal work, and there was these just incredible, impeccable field fortifications, and they were buried in the woods. And you know, 98% of the visitors who came to this particular site where I worked, they never saw it. It wasn't on the driving tour. It wasn't connected to any of the stops. And so there was a debate, you know, if we create a trail into the woods so that people can see these again, they were pretty exceptional earthworks. Uh, one side said, no, if you do that, then you're going to risk, as you said, our job of preserving and protecting. Whereas another camp said, but, you know, what's the point? If they stay there forever, but they're essentially hidden, nobody's actually learning from it. So how do you deal with something like that? And what's your personal philosophy? Well, uh, I mean, you're right. I mean, there can be, um, you know, a tension between accessibility um, and, you know, the making these resources available to the public. Uh, because, I mean, we are a public agency. You know, we are uh, preserving, conserving these places uh, for the enjoyment of the public. Um, and that can be, you know, kind of a difficult balancing act. Because like you said, you know, if, you, if we take an example of earthen fortifications that were built by Civil War soldiers, right? Um, as you said, earthworks. Uh, we have to understand that, you know, cultural resources begin to deteriorate almost from the moment of their creation, right? So earthworks, uh, those, those uh, uh, earthen fortifications, they're eroding you know, um, almost from the beginning. And, uh, and so by providing access and by um, opening them up to interaction, uh, sometimes can open up to accelerated erosion. You know, people might want to walk on them. Uh, people might want to, you know, uh, walk around or climb in them. And that can, can possibly lead to accelerated erosion. So what we do as Park Service and Cultural Resource Managers is, you know, we look at things such as that, you know, the earthworks to make them accessible, to put a trail through the woods back to them. Is it necessary? Um, you know, we ask the questions, can you interpret that resource perhaps a different way? Does it have to be right there on site? Is that resource of such significance that it, you know, needs to be interpreted? Um, and then, if we're going to open it to interpretation, what can we do to try to protect and minimize uh, harm and damage? Um, and so that's what cultural resource managers do. We ask these questions because, again, as I said, the idea is we're not taking care of these resources, those earthworks for us or for our career, our generation. They're supposed to be here for as long as we can. And, the, you know, and, and but we also know that with earthworks, you know, they aren't going to last forever. They are due to weather eroding always. So uh, now it might be 100, 200, 300 years, um, but we want to reduce, uh, you know, the impact to them. So we work with the park planning. That's where our information fits into planning. You know, what is the planning uh, with regard to trails and protection of that resource if we are going to open it up to uh, easy accessibility? So to kind of follow up on that, so you're talking about the the natural deterioration of resources and kind of the evolution of, of preservation because of those conditions that are naturally occurring. Um, the interpretation, of course, of those resources is always evolving as well. It's not static. Um, and of course, when you have all of these amazing resources that you're working with, you have, of course, layered histories, not only of what happened on the ground in say 1862 or 63 or 64, whatever, you know, part of the war that you're dealing with at the, the time. Um, but you're also interpreting um, how that landscape has been remembered, commemorated. Um, how do you balance those changing, evolving interpretations of the landscape? Do you want to preserve them all? Do you want to present them all? Do you have to make choices about uh, revising and, and how transparent are you? How do you make those decisions in terms of um, showing the evolution of the interpretation uh, since the Park Service, you know, came to acquire the resources? All right. Um, it is difficult. It's very difficult. Um, and uh, I think I did a program once for uh, one of 
uh, Pete's classes in the sunken road at Fredericksburg, and I described it as the most complicated landscape in our park. And we have 8,000 acres uh, in this park covering the battlefields of Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville Wilderness, Spotsylvania, and a couple other sites. Um, and the layering of history, I mean, you're right, you know, Ashley, I mean, no landscape is static. We can't freeze time. Um, and, you know, there will constantly be changes upon the landscape as we uh, managers, uh, the Park Service, change things such as new signs or different signs or new paths. Um, we are impacting the landscape ourselves. And uh, that's why we often refer to what we do as not necessarily preservation, but conservation. You know, we're preserving elements, but we're also providing accessibility. You know, we have to use the landscape and the resources themselves. And, um, and yeah, I mean, you know, for instance, my park here, you know, Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania, we were created as a national park in 1927, uh, 60 years since the battles had, well, since the Civil War had ended, 60 plus years since the battles here. And, uh, you know, for visitors who go to the Fredericksburg battlefield, stand in Sunken Road, you're staring into people's backyards. Um, so, you know, the landscape has altered. Um, and even what we own has altered. Uh, we're still acquiring land that's part of that corridor and part of that resource. And so, uh, you know, there are all sorts of uh, layers uh, upon the landscape. And, you know, our enabling legislation, uh, again, we are a, uh, the National Park Service is a federal agency. And, um, you know, cultural resource managers, we like laws. We like our regulations because it, it does help guide what we do. We have to look back to what is our purpose. And, you know, our enabling legislation uh, for this park says that we are to preserve uh, features of the park, whether they be earthwork, or I'm sorry, of the battlefields, whether they be earthworks, breastworks, stone walls, buildings. But we are also doing that in order to commemorate um, and that we are building roads. Um, we are allowing the erection of markers, monuments, uh, paths, that type of thing. So our enabling legislation actually says that in addition to preserving these resources, um, we are commemorating. And uh, so what we have and what many battlefield parks have are these layers of, you know, there are the earthworks that the soldiers built and fought behind. There may be the fields that uh, the charges and the attacks occurred upon. Um, but then there are other resources uh, that we have put upon the landscape. Um, and those, like I said, take the form of monuments, buildings, um, all sorts of things. And that's part of the commemorative element and commemorative mission, um, you know, that has come along with the creation of the park. Uh, we are to preserve, but we're also to commemorate. And, uh, and so, uh, so it's a very difficult thing uh, to manage because, uh, you know, the we look at the battlefield landscape and then, you know, we put monuments on it or we put signs up and those things change that battlefield landscape. And so that's why, as you said, the landscapes are not static. So how do we balance it? Well, that's where park management comes in and our information, the cultural resource managers or specialists provide hopefully will help inform those decisions um, about whether it's a trail plan, a new plan to build trails throughout the park, a wayside exhibit, which are the signs you see in the parks, uh, a plan for new signs uh, and that sort of thing. So trying to balance them um, can be, can be difficult. And, uh, you know, we are constantly ourselves creating history, you know, in the fact that what we do as far as signs, buildings, et cetera, you know, if they are old enough and around long enough, you know, they become historic themselves and we have to consider, do they themselves have some, some value and some significance? So, you know, we, we, we're reaching a hundred years here with this park and we have a lot of resources that are going to be reaching a hundred years. And that's, you know, it's an interesting thing to manage. Uh, but that's what we're paid to do is to try and manage these resources. So Eric, why don't we go to our first source? <laughs> and, and you could show it, uh, which is the Richard Kirkland monument, I believe. All right. Yeah. Let's see here. Okay. 
All right, did that, there we go, that came up. Uh, uh, absolutely, and just to quickly reiterate what Eric uh, just said that, you know, I think for the vast majority of the people who come to national parks and probably our listeners as well, they probably rarely think of a Civil War park as a commemorative landscape, but Eric, you've pointed out very nicely to us that there are layers uh, that are preserved by the National Park Service over time. And one of those layers, of course, is the layer of monumentation. So could you again talk to us just a little bit about this monument and um, about how that shapes the way visitors understand and interact with the landscape? Sure, sure. Um, uh, the Richard Kirkland Monument uh, pictured here um, is a monument that was dedicated in 1965. Uh, so this was um, really the last of the Civil War uh, centennial activities in Fredericksburg, as well as one of the last uh, nationally. And when I say Civil War centennial, I mean the 50 or 100 year uh, commemoration um, of uh, the American Civil War, uh, which, you know, created all sorts of resources and uh, numerous events nationwide. Uh, but this one went up in 1965 as the last um, uh, activity of the Fredericksburg Civil War uh, Centennial Committee. And it sits on Sunken Road. Um, the Sunken Road, for those who haven't been there, uh, Sunken Road was the uh, one of the Confederate defensive positions during the December 1862 Battle of Fredericksburg. Uh, Confederates were in the road. There was a stone wall to the east of the road that the Confederates used as a defensive position. As this photo shows up behind the Confederates, the land rises up to a ridge called Marie's Heights. Confederates were stationed up there, their artillery, their cannons, and on December 13th beat back uh, numerous Union uh, assaults that came out of the town of Fredericksburg uh, and across open plains to the east of uh, the Confederate position. And one of the stories that came out of this, and it's a, uh, you know, we, historians are still continuing to research the story of Richard Kirkland. Uh, Richard Kirkland was a, uh, a sergeant in the second South Carolina infantry, a Confederate soldier who fought in the sunken road behind the stone wall. And uh, the first instance I think that we have found of the story of Richard Kirkland uh, is a post-war, I believe 1870s uh, now, but we continue to learn more as more folks research. But the story is that Richard Kirkland on the, uh, uh, after the battle, as the Union dead and, and wounded were lying out in front of the Confederate position, the cries and moans of the wounded Union soldiers, uh, Richard Kirkland requested and received permission to fill uh, water canteens, climb over the wall, and uh, go out into that exposed area and begin giving water to the wounded Union soldiers. Um, and so that is the story of Richard Kirkland. It's a very prominent one with the Battle of Fredericksburg, certainly very prominent uh, here in Fredericksburg. And so for our visitors, when they walk along Sunken Road today, and Sunken Road is maybe three blocks, four blocks long, it's not terribly long, uh, the Confederate position that is in the park, uh, this is at the very end, this very large monument uh, sitting uh, on a rise of ground just in front of the Confederate position. Now, the monument itself, as I said, was dedicated in 1965, and it really was the work of, of uh, uh, really one individual. Um, he was a native of South Carolina, and he was a local Fredericksburg de uh, dentist named uh, Dr. Richard Nunn Lanier. Uh, he was also the director of the Fredericksburg uh, Civil War Centennial Commission. And so Dr. Lanier for almost a decade was raising monies, uh, money for a, a monument to Richard Kirkland. He uh, uh, very, was very much taken with the story. Um, and uh, Dr. Lanier uh, by 1964, I believe, had completed the fundraising. Uh, and uh, he contracted with Felix de Weldon, um, most folks will recognize him for his work on the Iwo Jiwa Memorial, uh, Memorial uh, at Arlington, but uh, Felix Dewelden sculpted what we see here, a depiction of Richard Kirkland providing water to a wounded Union soldier. Um, and it sits uh, right in front of the sunken road. Uh, you stand in the Confederate position behind the original section of the stone wall and staring right in front of you uh, is this large monument. 
Um, and I think it's worth noting also that when it was erected in 1965, this was not National Park Service ground. Uh, this was ground that was owned by Mary Washington College. Uh, the large building you see in the photo up on the ground behind, uh, that is Brompton, uh, the Marie Plantation home, a war, Civil War structure that is today the home of the president for Mary Washington College. So uh, Mary Washington had acquired this property in essence to keep a uh, apartment complex from going up uh, and thus being visible uh, from the president's home. Uh, but nonetheless, they owned it in 1965. And this is where Dr. Lanier uh, was able to get his, his monument erected. Uh, we, the National Park Service acquired the property in 1987 and thus inherited uh, the Kirkland Monument. So there's a little bit about Kirkland himself. Uh, like I said, it's just a, a very large uh, story. And, and Pete, you used to work, you know, here on the battlefields when you were in college. Uh, uh, you and I were uh, summer employees, I think, overlapping one summer here. But uh, you gave tours along Sunken Road. So you remember uh, just how uh, large a story uh, Kirkland is. It, 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 it was the perfect bedtime story. Uh, for visitors, right, who wanted to forget the, the carnage of 10,000 Union soldiers being shot down in front of Marie's Heights. And even to this day, I, I don't want to go too far and generalize about how people interpret or don't interpret this monument, but I'm going to throw it right back to you, Eric. Eric, you've talked about sort of your trajectory from starting as an interpreter, as a seasonal, and even, you know, some of your permanent days, you did that as well. And now you do cultural resources. Could you help us understand that how did you utilize that monument in your early interpretation at the Sunken Lane? And what would you do, what would you do differently now, now that you have, you know, again, got some years behind you? Obviously, you've read a lot more, but you're now cultural resources management, you're interested in commemorative landscapes. What would you what, what would look very different now if you were to give a, a sunken road tour? Well, um, I'll be perfectly honest, Pete. When, when we were seasonals here, uh, you know, as a summer employee straight out of college, you know, I gave tours on Sunken Road and I never once mentioned Richard Kirkland. Uh, there's another very prominent story. Uh, uh, a woman, Martha Stevens, who did not leave her house on Sunken Road and, and survived the battle. Uh, I never mentioned those stories uh, just simply because, uh, for one thing, I had a time limit of 30 minutes. Uh, you know, we had to get out and get back in 30 minutes um, and give a tour of the Battle of Fredericksburg. And so I'll be honest, I didn't didn't linger on those big stories because, you know, uh, there were signs about Martha Stevens. And, you know, I'll be perfectly honest for the monument, you know, our, our perception and the way we approached monuments back uh, then I believe was, you know, the monuments kind of speak for themselves, right? You can go up, there's something etched on them um, and you can read them. And so personally, I, I, I did not address Richard Kirkland at all uh, when I gave tours there. How would I do things differently today? Well, uh, you know, I, as you said, I've grown uh, in my knowledge. Uh, that was the other thing in 1993, straight out of college. I didn't know a lot about the Battle of Fredericksburg to get too terribly involved in it or the park history, but uh, I now have 20, 30 years of, of research and knowledge. And so when I give tours and talks today out on, on the battlefield, uh, or I should say out in the park on these landscapes, I like to talk about the resources. You know, I mean, that's, that's my job is, is talking about the resources. So today, giving a tour of the Sunken Road, um, I would definitely talk about Richard Kirkland's, uh, you know, the monuments and, you know, the fact that it, you know, it, it was erected in 1965 as part of a community effort, uh, and uh, you know, ask the folks to read the the inscriptions and uh, you know, see what they feel and think about the monument. Uh, so I definitely use it today. And you mentioned the inscription. Can you? Um, I think you have a, an up close picture of one side of the monument, right? That has the inscription that we see kind of in the corner there. Can you show that? Sure. Um, uh, there we go. There you go. So that that in and of itself could lead to a, a great interpretive discussion, bringing uh, your group out to the battlefield. What are, 
what are kind of the layers of interpretation that you would would go through in terms of incorporating the story into the story of what happened on the battlefield, but also in terms of um, the what this particular portion of the commemorative landscape is supposed to make a visitor walk away with feeling or thinking about this part of the, the battlefield? What, what challenges and opportunities do you see in this particular verbiage, in this particular aspect of the monument that leads to some of this rich discussion um, that you've probably had with, with visitors about the monument as it pertains to the, the actual fighting of 1862? All right, well, the, you know, the, uh, again, um, and you know, the information and the accumulation of information obviously informs us, and and that's you know the basis for you know cultural resource management is is research and and gathering as much as you can know. Um, I'll be honest, uh, I would admit that we really haven't dug deep at this monument um, as far as its history, its origin, that until recently, and and a lot of what we are receiving um, as far as information is coming from outside, and. It's enlightening. Um, it's applicable. Uh, you know the uh, why did they choose to put up a monument to Richard Kirkland in 1965? Um, you know, Dr. Lanier was you know the primary mover and shaker. He had his own personal interests, uh, perhaps. Uh, well, actually, he did. Um, but uh, you know, uh, the Richard Kirkland story itself uh, came out. You know, I think it was, again first came to light in the 1870s. Um, and uh, so looking at where this story of, again, you know, uh, reconciliation, you know, here's a man who, uh, you know, I think we used to kid that uh, in, you know, uh, uh, you know, as, as young historians or interpreters, you know, it just kind of trying to explain to folks the fact that, you know, he went out to help wounded uh, Union soldiers, many of which perhaps he shot, um, you know, the so that sort of juxtaposition um, and that approach, and again, the focus on this brotherhood, as it says here. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, it's interesting to look at those. You know, what is what is the purpose of this resource? Because again, I think Ashley, as you said, yeah, you know, landscapes aren't static. And when we come to commemorative landscapes and we look at these things, you know, what are the values that they reflect from the people who put them up and, and that sort of thing? And, um, and so, you know, one of the interesting things I, I recently discovered is we had a, I think it was a grad student, um, University of uh, uh, Maryland sent us a paper recently within the last few months uh, that he had done on the, on the Kirkland Monument. And he had dug into some papers of Lanier that we didn't even know existed. And, you know, in addition to what it says here, dedicated to national unity and the brotherhood of man, in his actual uh, solicitation letters that he sent out, his fundraising letters, uh, Lanier talking about the monument. And again, this is 19, 1950s, 1960s. He said in these letters, these are critical days in our history when the free world must stand or fall against the tyranny of international communist conspirators. It is important that all of our citizens, North, South, East and West, forge new bonds of friendship among ourselves. So here we have a monument going up during the Cold War and, you know, this idea of national unity and brotherhood of man. So there's a lot of things going on um, and get folks to talk about it. So, uh, you know, it is interesting. There's more to learn and more to dig into. But, you know, it's uh, uh, when we ask, does the monument speak for itself? Uh, you know, uh, perhaps we we can add a little bit to it with our research. It seems to me that there's a lot to add to it. And I think that that. Yeah. One of the things that's crying out now is that all these monuments are not just Confederate ones, uh, that they deserve added contextualization. And of course, our, many in our audience probably don't know that Ashley was a longtime MPS employee, a permanent at Richmond National Park. So my question is to both of you. Uh, and this is in part because I feel a great deal of, um, yeah, embarrassment. It's certainly a lost opportunity. I mean, of all those walking tours, you know, I allowed people to go by after I spoke about the carnage, the human carnage before Maurice Heights. I spoke about the bitterness and the sense of vengeance that Confederates felt because they had witnessed some of the destruction of the town of Fredericksburg, all of that. And then I turned them loose on this monument. So I asked now both of you, if you're going to train some young seasonals and you say, hey, listen, I need you to show that sort of the tension 
that exists between this monument and the story that we tell. Should we not, in fact, encourage people to go to this monument and to say, but this is a falsification of the past. Is that a useful way to get people to be thinking about this monument? Because it doesn't really make any sense when you think about what happened on December 13th, 1862. It might make sense for 1965, and it might make sense for what maybe Americans seek now, but as two past interpreters, because Eric's not an interpreter anymore. What do you do here? Right? What do you do here? Because I think this is a very problematic monument. And it's not because whether Kirkland did it or not. That's what everyone gets all obsessed about. I could care less about that. I care about this. So, Ashley, what do you say to young interpreters? What do they do with this? I think that this, I mean, this is an excellent source to pit against um, primary accounts of soldiers who were there. Um, so you get kind of the cacophony of voices. Um, I think that you don't have to give a, you know, a siloed tour just on, you know, the commemorative aspect of the landscape or, you know, monuments in order to tell this story. I think you can absolutely and should probably encourage um, interpreters to actively incorporate this monument, what it is trying to get visitors to walk away with its interpretive message into the context of the actual battlefield story, perhaps you know, leaving them with the more provocative aspect of, and now, you know, fast forward, you know, over a hundred years after this battle, this is the story that a lot of people, you know, have been told to walk away with um, and see how that doesn't exactly jive with, with the actual stories of the participants uh, who talked about that savagery, who talked about, of course, their dedication to two diametrically opposed causes. Um, but I think it has to be a, an integral part um, of any interpretive tour, I would say, especially when it looms so large physically uh, over the actual landscape that you're interpreting. Eric, what do you think? Uh, I'd ask the chief of interpretation, uh, what, what, what he wanted to do. Uh, I, honestly, I mean, again, the you know interpretation in my view, uh, you know, should be about the resource um, and, you know, which it is, and uh, this is a resource. So it's open for interpretation, certainly. Um, you know, again, cultural resource management, what we do is we provide the information. Right. You know, every park has a division or a branch of interpretation and uh, has a chief, and hopefully every park has a, what they refer to as a long range interpretive plan, which right. is a plan for the park's interpretation. Um, and again, what we do is we provide the research and the information for that planning process. Um, I don't oversee interpreters. I would like to arm. I try to, when I talk to interpreters who are interested in something or working someplace, I do try to provide them with as much information about those resources as I can. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the sunken road is just an interesting place overall that I found very difficult when I was, you know, 23 uh, working on it and managing it now, uh, you know, it's just, you can't see the battlefield. You can't see the fields where the army's charged. And so what we really do have is a dominant commemorative landscape. And uh, so if we're giving tours, you know, uh, there's nothing wrong with giving tours of the commemorative landscape. You know, it's, it's the park, you know? And uh, so talking about things such as the monument or other, um, you know, features or developments that occur along there, uh, that were designed to commemorate, uh, you know, the event. I don't see there's anything wrong with, you know, discussing that either. Yeah, I think that goes back to, I mean, several years ago um, when people were complaining that there weren't any national parks specifically dedicated to reconstruction. Um, and in my point of view, I, I guess you could say, well, aren't our, all battlefields parks to reconstruction in some sense, because there are parks that interpret and preserve and, you know, commemorate memory. Um, so they they tell that story. And that's the the long arc that I feel like as interpreters, at least, um, we we probably should have a responsibility in, in telling that story and, and not leaving people, you know, back in 1862, or even back in 1865, or 1877. Um, that that's a central part of the story as well, because as we keep saying, the landscapes aren't static. The history there isn't anchored to one particular day or, or year or event. Right. right. And, 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 and along the, you know, again, the idea of, of knowledge, right. Um, you know, the, uh, 
when I started working at Fredericksburg, there was essentially a magazine. Uh, you know, I mean, n- none of the books that we have now really had been written about the battle. And so, you know, we rely heavily on the scholarship outside of our agency, right? Um, outside of our parks um, for context. Um, and, you know, I believe that we're seeing, um, you know, a very strong interest in the commemorative landscapes of these places. You know, I think to Dr. Timothy Smith's uh, two books on the early development of battlefield parks and, you know, the history of Civil War battlefield preservation or, uh, you know, doctors uh, Thomas Brown and Adam Dombey's you know, recent books in the last year on monuments or Civil War monuments. And, uh, uh, you know, even the histories of the park themselves, Dr. Jen Murray's book on Gettysburg and Dr. Joan Zenzen, who wrote on uh, a history of the Manassas Park, as well as our own. Uh, you know, all of that provides us the context and the information that we can provide to our interpreters uh, to give programs. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're seeing a strong interest in that scholarships getting out there and is becoming more available uh, for us and our staff. I think it's also though important to note that the information that you provide to the chief of interpretation and to the other interpreters that there is, at least from my experience, uh, a fair amount of latitude that those interpreters have in terms of how they construct or create their programs. And so I think it's important for people to know that there's not really an official interpretation that is handed down and they send off the interpreters and then they pair it along. Uh, to my knowledge, I can't think of a single park where we have sent our Pohanka summer interns in which they're handed a script and I think there's a lot of visitors who are coming. I never, I really loved after a long day where Stonewall Jackson died, you're exhausted. You know, you've seen, you know, a hundred people. And it's been quiet and someone shows up. And the first thing they say is, boy, you must be pretty lonely here. So then now I'm a little edgy, right? And then the second line, okay, why don't you give us your spiel? Like, okay, just, I'm a, you know, just push the button and I would just repeat the script that has been implanted in my head. And I think that, you know, that's the great thing about the park service is people like you who are working in cultural resource management. We don't have as many historians in the park service as we once did, and we should have, but we have chief of interps and they are coming together to be able to train and to create conversations with their staff is a good thing. Eric, I think one thing we'd like to turn to is you know, you've spoken about the many layers of these historical sites and you have done some, I think, important work uh, here at, Fredericksburg and at the bookstore, many of our listeners and watchers have seen it. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? And that's, of course, work that you've done with uh, the students at Mary Washington College or University. Sure, sure. If we've got a few minutes here um, for a visit for those uh, uh, on viewing today. Um, if you've not been to the Sunken Road, to the Fredericksburg National Cemetery, to the Fredericksburg Battlefield Visitor Center, um, behind the Visitor Center um, is this small building. Uh, The visitor center and this building were constructed in the uh, mid-1930s. And, uh, you know, the visitor center was built as the park headquarters administration uh, in the 1960s. It converted over to a visitor center as we know it. This little building was the very first park maintenance building. Um, And uh, today, uh, I think it was about 1994, we converted it over to our bookstore. Uh, It had been a maintenance building and converted to our bookstore. On the right there in the photo, you will see the restroom that we use for a handicap restroom. Our restrooms inside the visitor center, uh, both the women's room and the men's uh, restroom are in the basement. Um, And uh, a visitor center or a building constructed in the 1930s doesn't have an elevator in it. And so uh, we have made, uh, you know, this room available for our visitors who who, uh, cannot... uh, make it down the stairs. Um, So, um, and recently the handicap restroom there on the right, a few years ago, our maintenance staff wanted to uh, do a little work in there. Said it was looking a little rough. Um, They wanted to do, uh, you know, some rehab work. They wanted to pull some of the fixtures out, put newer ones in, clean it up, uh, make it look a little nicer. Well, we go through a process when we do something like that. We're like, well, what do we know about this building? And what do we know about that space? And uh, so we start the research because 
again, the last thing we want to do is do damage to something that later on we said, oh, I wish we hadn't done that because it's finite, it's irreplaceable. And because this building was constructed in the 1930s, um, as part of the park development, it's part of that sort of commemorative layer, right? Um, you know, providing facilities for uh, visitors, et cetera. So it has a certain level of, of interest and significance. So uh, going to historic photos, and this is something that honestly was in plain sight, but we never realized. This is a photo from when the building was completed. 1936, I believe, is the photo. Um, and again, you can see the three bays for the garage. On the right, there is a building. It has some lettering on, you know, uh, or on the right is a door. has some lettering on it. There's the sign saying that this was a uh, public works project. So it's part of the New Deal um, projects that uh, we got uh, structures. So we zeroed in on the door um, on the right. What's the lettering say? And it says men colored. Um, and we looked at additional photos and the door you see on the right, um, which we I don't have a straight on, it says women colored. Uh, so this was the first kind of, honestly, I believe to us here at the park, uh, first uh, thing that we'd seen that indicated that we had segregated facilities uh, in our national park. Um, and what we learned is that national parks um, followed the state um, laws and traditions when it came to uh, facilities uh, during that during the Jim Crow era. And uh, so in 1936, when this was built, um, we had segregated restroom facilities. So with that in mind, uh, we began the discussion of the interior um, of the uh, restroom. There is a photo on the left of the uh, African-American restroom, the men's room, um, when it was completed in 1936. We had to do a little digging to find this photo, but we did. There's a photo of, of the uh, uh, space on the right. Now the fixtures have changed, but what you'll notice is the coat hooks on the wall, still there from 1936. That subway tile on the wall, still there. Um, the pipe running at the base there uh, actually supplies a radiator. Uh, this just outside of the photo to the right. You know, the pipe has changed and been you know, replaced, but it's still in the same area. And so when we brought in our architectural historian, uh, I'm not uh, an architectural historian, I'm not an archeologist. You know, we consult with professionals in those fields. Um, and uh, when I brought him in, he said, you know, this really has integrity. Uh, it would be a really good idea if, if you can to avoid, you know, ripping the tile off the wall, taking off the coat hooks, do what you can to conserve this and, and preserve this space, uh, these elements. Um, that in and of itself uh, led to a very interesting uh, rabbit hole I went down. And, you know, this is the interesting thing about cultural resource management and the jobs that we do. I would have never thought uh, ever when I started a career working for the National Park Service on a Civil War battlefield that I would spend two, three days researching men's urinals. <laughs> uh, that's exactly what I did. We had a urinal in there that was cracked and our maintenance staff wanted to remove it. And I had to do the research to see if, is that the original urinal? Is that part of the historic fabric of this space? Uh, as it turns out, it was not, um, which I'm, cur I'm sure, I know our curator is excited about. Otherwise we would have had a urinal in the museum collection. But, uh, but nonetheless, you know, those are the things that we get involved in. And, and honestly, it was quite interesting. Um, uh, but, uh, we decided to, you know, we're going to continue to use this space we're, you know, the day may come when the national park service decides to get rid of this building, you know, that as actually we were talking about sort of that juggling of layers of landscape, you know, uh, to rehabilitate the battlefield landscape someday, it may be decided to remove this building, but we don't have plans for that. So while we have this place and we're going to continue to use it, why don't we talk, tell our public a little bit about it? And so we worked with um, the University of Mary Washington uh, here in Fredericksburg in their Department of History and American Studies and working with their public history class, uh, we, uh, they developed this sign 
Uh, we worked with them on it. Uh, our division of interpretation worked with them on this sign. And this now stands, this sign in front of uh, the bookstore. Um, and it talks about the fact that, you know, we were a segregated uh, park. And that's part of, you know, that commemorative era, that commemorative layer, you know, facilities being provided yet segregated. And this is all new to us. And, but to, to figure out, you know, how to understand this and do we have other facilities? Do we have other things that, that you know, harken back to segregation and, and, uh, and uh, Jim Crow here in the park? Uh, the Park Service actually contracted with the professor at Mary Washington, uh, Dr. Aaron Devlin, uh, to do a historic resource study on segregation, racial segregation in Virginia's national parks. And I believe Aaron, I haven't talked to her in a while, but I believe Dr. Devlin is, is uh, planning, if not hoping, uh, hoping, if not planning, uh, to have that resource study finished um, this uh, year, this calendar year. So a historic resource study provides the context. It tells us, because we didn't realize, uh, and other Virginia parks may not have realized, uh, but here's a deep dive into our own history. Um, and it's what we do, cultural resource management. We're here, the park was created because of Civil War battlefields, yet there are other resources that take on national significance. There are resources quite possibly we're creating today that will be of national significance down the road. And so even though they may not pertain directly, meaning they aren't resources from 1862, we still have to take them into consideration. We have to uh, look at them, really discuss and provide this information for our management. So when it goes forward, uh, someday, whatever this building gets used for down the road, if it changes, this information will play into it. Um, and it provided the opportunity for us to work with the university and the students to get some experience. And uh, you know, the interpreters tell us that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the visitors going in, pulling into the parking lot, uh, they've received a lot of, you know, positive comments about this. Uh, and it's a surprise even, uh, and to our own staff. And so, you know, that's part of cultural resource management. Again, doing the research making sure that we use that research and planning so that we don't do irreparable harm. Uh, we're good stewards. Uh, so we'll pass on, you know, we didn't rip the subway tile, which I think perhaps maintenance would have preferred because they'd like to put something up that's just easier to clean. Um, but, you know, we, we, we pay attention to it. And it's a part of that commemorative layer, uh, providing facilities. I'm, I'm sorry you weren't able to save the urinal. Well, maybe we still have it, Pete. I'll drop it off on your. Uh, please, on, uh, please. On your I'd, yeah. I'd like a memento from that. But, but no, it, both both the architectural historian and I did chuckle about the fact that we were spending a lot of time talking to American Standard, um, trying to figure out what model you know we were looking at. So uh, I just, it's, it's interesting. I'd like to sort of wrap this thing up and connect something that Ashley said and that you have said, Eric, and. The stewardship that you do at Fredericksburg and that others like you at other national parks is, again, so valuable, invaluable, uh, not just in ensuring that it's going to have longevity, but also being that bridge to interpreters so that they can communicate. And Ashley's excellent point about, you know, we are at Civil War battlefields. We have a commemorative landscape that speaks to reconstruction, that speaks to reconciliation and reunion. But it seems to me that there is still an opportunity here. And I'm hoping that as we look down the road, that we'll find ways, for instance, that this is fascinating. People going to the bookstore that they see this sign, but I'm hoping that interpreters have the ability to be able to point to that sign and ask questions of our visitors. Yeah. Was this war worth it? Because for many of our visitors, they see segregation as a second form of slavery that the Civil War was this great bloodletting and really nothing significant or meaningful or radical that came out of it. One could go to the Kirkland Monument as well and maybe reach some questionable conclusions. But I mean, all this comes back to, I think, Eric, what you're pointing to, and that is this need uh, for academics and park service historians to come together so they can take what some people might find as a curiosity. Hell, I don't want visitors to see this thing or this sign as a curiosity at Fredericksburg. 
I want them to be thinking about the long-term implications or ramifications of the Civil War. And you're, the kind of work, Eric, that you're doing here and others are, I think, is setting the stage to get these people, again, our visitors, to think about these big issues that still resonate today. Yeah, well, and I, I appreciate that, and I agree. Um, I agree certainly with that. And, you know, as I was putting this together and thinking about, you know, our talk today, you know, one of the things I kept coming back to is, you know, looking at this building um, and, you know, and other buildings that the park has created, you know, it's interesting in the fact that I feel it's important as stewards, you know, we're, we're in the long history of the park, our individual, you know, contribution is going to be, you know, kind of a, a little bit, right? Um, you know, it's not about us, uh, the interpreters or the historians, it's about the park and the resources, mm -hmm. and it's about our public. And so, uh, you know, being a good steward is about passing these things on uh, to the next, whether it's our research, whether it's our knowledge, whether it's, you know, hopefully these sites uh, we're passing on. And one thing that I've certainly learned in 27 years is, uh, is listening to the younger generation. Uh, you know, I love talking to the interns and the seasonals that come every summer because when we look at these buildings, this is 1933. You know, when you and I worked here in college, this building was only 60 years old and nobody gave it any consideration as a historic resource. Absolutely. You know, we have Mission 66 buildings, which are buildings built by the Park Service in the 1960s that now have their own architectural significance and things like that. You know, there are staff working in the parks, very few at this point, but they remember them being built. And so when you use your own, you know, frame of reference, your own lifespan, they don't, you know, they don't view them as necessarily historic, but the seasonals and the interns coming in are like, man, that's old and that's very important and that's cool. And so when we pass it on, we need to keep in mind, I think that you know, our personal, uh, you know, uh, memories and time frame. we need to listen to those coming later because, you know, the students who worked on this project got, I mean, they were jazzed about it. They really were. Uh, whereas there are folks, you know, working that just, it's not historic. Uh, so I think it's important that we listen to those, you know, those multitude of voices uh, when we're looking at these resources. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's also a good reminder too for students who, you know, they're, they're scratching at the door of the NPS or any in, uh, site where they want to be frontline interpreters. And they, that's kind of their only view of public history is giving tours um, and doing that, you know, the, the, the front of the house kind of work. Uh, but this obviously shows that work in cultural resources in, um, you know, museum and curatorial type work can be so fundamental to the presentation that is going on at the front of the house when you're doing kind of the back of the house type research um, and contextualization. So I, I would think that this kind of project would be exciting and, and give them hope um, that there is something beyond the world of, of given tours, um, you know, in the green and gray that can be profound and, and transformational in terms of shaping the interpretation of a site. Absolutely. Yeah, I hope so, because we need cultural resource managers. Uh, yeah. Always will. So moving forward. Good. Well, Eric, thank you so much. Uh, and we appreciate you being the first guest on Finding the Source. Ashley, I don't have my notes in front of me. So who is next week's guest? So next week we have uh, Dr. Abby Cooper, uh, who teaches at Brandeis University. She's going to be talking about her scholarship on contraband camps uh, during the Civil War. Um, so she will be October 8th at 1230. And again, if you all can't um, make it right at the time um, at 1230, we are going to be saving these videos and uploading them to our YouTube channel, um, as well as hopefully our CWI uh, webpage in, in some form. Um, so that you can catch them later on. And we'll be doing that with this video as well after the fact. Good. Good. Fantastic. Eric, thank you again. Ashley, I'll be seeing you around the shop at some point here. Indeed. All right. All right. Take care, y'all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah, Thanks, no, Eric. Thanks, Eric. All right. All right. Bye. It's just us. Right. No, it's just me. <laughs> yeah.